Welcome to part 21 in the series on the end of the age. In this episode, I'm going to focus on verses 36 to 45 in chapter 11 of Daniel, with particular reference to the abomination that causes desolation and the implications, the importance of this particular event that is highlighted by Daniel, but also referred to by the Lord Jesus in his Olivet Discourse when he presents to us all the facts concerning his second coming. So there is a particular importance attached to this event, the abomination that causes desolation. So let's just kick off by looking at the introduction to this final vision that is given to Daniel because a statement is made by the angel, which I believe is very important. It is the foundation which points us in the right direction to understanding what this vision is all about. It was in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belteshazzar, that was his Babylonian name. Its message was true, and it concerned a great war or a great conflict. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. So this great war and great conflict were given an, a bit of an insight in the book of Daniel. In fact, this is quite a unique insight into the fact that this conflict and war was taking place in the heavenly realm by the spiritual principalities and powers. Now, underneath them or their puppets were the human nations that are referred to. So there are kings and nations and conquerors that are being used by these principalities and powers to manipulate things in the Middle East. And this is what we're being told. So while a lot of these events took place shortly after Daniel had received this vision, and they highlight the chaos of the Greek Empire, and out of this chaos eventually emerged a man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes, who was a picture of the final man who is to emerge, the Antichrist. So we're being shown what is taking place in the unseen realm to help us to understand what is taking place on earth, with these nations. So we need to keep that in mind as we interpret and understand what Daniel has been given as this great prophecy of the end times. Now, as I said in the previous episode, the teaching of the Antichrist in the Bible and all the information that is given to us is not just a minor thing. It's not something that we can sweep aside as a passing interest. It actually takes not center stage. The center stage is given to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He is the central theme of the whole Bible. But alongside him is also a lot of information that is given to us about this, this arch enemy that the devil is going to use at the end of the age. So the teaching of the Antichrist is one of the greatest signs of the end of the age. And the New Testament writers refer to this, and it becomes clear, as you see what they say, that they gave a lot of teaching to the early church about the Antichrist. And that's why I believe we need to give attention to this teaching, not become obsessed by it, because there are many who become obsessed by the Antichrist and the 666 and the mysteries and all these things. So we don't become obsessed by it, but we need to be aware of it because it is something that we're told we should look out for. And when we see the Antichrist appear on the scene, we know that the glorious return of the Lord Jesus Christ is imminent. And as I've been saying all along, we need to look up for our redemption is drawing near. So turning to the New Testament, let's see what John has to say about the subject. Dear children, this is the last hour. So from John's perspective, there is nothing more to come except the appearance of the Antichrist. So this is what he's saying. This is the last hour. And as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, so he had given teaching about the Antichrist and he was saying, this is what we should look out for. Although he says, even now, there are many Antichrists that have come. And even to this very day, there are many Antichrists around, but there is an ultimate Antichrist and he will be the sign of the end. So this is how we know that it is the last hour. So, in other words, we're being told that that is how we will know when the Antichrist, the ultimate Antichrist, appears. And then Daniel gives us all the information so that we can recognize who the ultimate Antichrist really is. So, all this information is vital for our understanding of the very end of the end. So, this is how we will know 
the very last hours of this age and we'll prepare ourselves for the coming of the Lord. So let's turn now to what Paul has to say about the subject. And this is a very familiar passage. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, the rapture, we ask you brothers not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So he's calling the coming of the Lord Jesus and the rapture, he's calling that the day of the Lord. So he's saying, don't be misled by the fact that some are saying that the day of the Lord has already come. He said that has not happened. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day, which day? The coming of the Lord and the rapture will not come unless the rebellion comes first or the falling away or the apostasy. So there will be a great falling away which will happen first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the Antichrist, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. So he's giving us this information so that we can identify who this man is. And Paul is telling us that the coming of the Lord Jesus and the rapture or the day of the Lord will not occur until, first of all, there's a falling away. And then this Antichrist, will, the ultimate Antichrist, will be revealed. So just like John, Paul had given teaching to the early church on this whole subject of the Antichrist. He says, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? So he had given teaching. He would have taken, no doubt, the book of Daniel and many of the other prophecies that also referred to what Jesus had said in Matthew 24, although Matthew 24 had not been written at that stage, but all of these things had been passed on. Paul knew what Jesus taught, and he makes reference to this. Then he says, and you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. So Paul is assuming that we know what is restraining the Antichrist. And obviously he had just told us that there will be a falling away first and then this Antichrist will be revealed. And that's what he's talking about. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. So just like John said, there are many Antichrists in the world. The mystery of lawlessness, Paul says, is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. So there is some form of restraint holding back the revelation of who this Antichrist is. Now, unfortunately, Paul doesn't tell us who the restrainer is. And huge doctrines have been built on this one little verse based on speculation. So we've got to be very careful about that. So let me put it to you like this. Irrespective of who the restrainer is, we're being told that a restraint is upon the revelation of the Antichrist until the appointed time. And when he is revealed, suddenly then all these events that Daniel is speaking about in chapter 11 will take place. So that's really what we need to keep in mind. So let's turn our attention now back to Daniel and look at some of the detail that is given to us about this Antichrist. And I want to go back to chapter 7 because there's an important statement that puts things into context for us. In chapter 7 and verse 8 we're told, While I was thinking about the horns, this is Daniel speaking, There before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. So a little horn is coming up, it replaces three horns. So in other words, these horns refer to leaders or kings, people in authority. So three of them are deposed and this little horn, in other words, an insignificant horn, rises up, deposes three, takes this position and actually grows in stature. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth that spoke boastfully. So jumping across then to chapter 11, but reading verse 21, which really was about Antiochus Epiphanes, but also about the Antichrist. So it has a dual fulfillment, as I said in the previous episode. He will be succeeded by a contemptible person who has not been given the honor of royalty. So he won't come from a royal dynasty, but he'll come out of obscurity. 
He will invade the kingdom when its people feel secure and he will seize it through intrigue. And we know also from what Daniel tells us in chapter 9 that he will confirm the covenant for seven years, for a week. So while the people of Israel feel secure, he will seize it through intrigue. So these are important facts that we need to keep in mind as we proceed. So this now is the critical issue. This is the turning point in history. This spells out the very end of the age. And we're told this. His armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. Now Antiochus Epiphanes did that, but it will be done again by the Antichrist. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. They. So the forces along with the Antichrist will do this. With flattery, he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant. So those who turn and join him, he will, um, he will honor them. But the people who know their God will firmly resist him. There will be a resistance. A remnant of the Jews will resist him. Now that's an important statement because there are some uh, Bible scholars that believe that the Antichrist will be a Jew and he will be welcomed by the Jews. But Daniel is telling us, no, there will be those who resist him. There will be some who join him and he will honor them, but there will be a resistance against him. Now, jumping across to the New Testament again, and I have made reference to this quite often, but it's so important because why is the abomination of desolation so significant? Let's hear from the Lord Jesus himself. So when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountain. So when you see this, then you know that big trouble is coming. And those that are in Judea, so the epicenter of this great trouble, this great tribulation, is the Middle East and particularly Jerusalem and Judea. Now, if you're living in the southern island of New Zealand and you say, well, I'm so far from this, it really doesn't affect me. The truth is it will affect all of us because it will permeate through the world. And this is the whole idea. This Antichrist intends to dominate the world. So there will be an, a ripple effect throughout the whole of the world. And we'll see that as we go on. Then Jesus says, let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great distress unequaled from the beginning of the world. Take note of that. Until now. And never to be equaled again. So this will be a unique, unequaled, unprecedented time of terrible trouble. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. Now we know how short they will be. They will be three and a half years. We're told that in the book of Daniel and also in the book of Revelation. And when you think back of the history of the world and the accounts that we have of genocides and of wars, just of the recent Second World War, the killing of six million Jews, the genocides in Rwanda and in various places, the horrific things that men have done to other men, the atrocities that have taken place. But Jesus is saying this tribulation will be unequaled from the beginning of the world and it will never be equaled again. This will be an isolated and unique but the most terrible time in the history of the world. So the question that we've got to ask is, why will it be unequaled since the beginning of the world? Why is it going to be unique and more terrifying than anything that has ever happened? Does the scripture answer this? And I do believe that it does. So let's look at the answer. So Revelation chapter 12 really gives us this answer. And there was war in heaven. Now remember, the angel told Daniel that he was going to talk about a great conflict and here is what we see. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, the devil, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, 
that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Notice that. So all principalities and powers working alongside, all the fallen angels working with Satan are all cast out of heaven. That's why it is unprecedented. So now they're not operating and using men as puppets from a heavenly unseen realm, but they're cast out of heaven and now they're down in the earthly realm, whether they're visible or not, we're not told, but no longer operate from their heavenly position of authority. Now they're down amongst us. And this is why it is unprecedented. This has never happened before, but we're told that this is going to happen. And the abomination of desolation will be the sign that this has taken place. Then we're told, Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. So heaven has been cleansed because the principalities and powers, the, the opposing fallen angels, have been cast out. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. Now here's a, a thought to consider where Paul said that he that restrains will restrain until he's taken out of the way. And as I said, there are various ideas as to who the restrainer might be. But may I put it to you, here is a very strong possibility that Satan himself is restraining. He does not want to be cast out of heaven. He doesn't want to lose his seat of authority. But the angel, Michael, and his angels come against the devil and his angels. There is war in heaven, and he is bundled out of heaven, cast down to the earth, and he comes down furious because he knows then that his time is short. So he is restraining and resisting and does not want to be cast down until the time comes when the Lord obviously gives the command and Michael casts him out. So jumping back now to Daniel, Daniel chapter 11 verse 36. The king, it says, referring to the Antichrist, will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the God of gods, against the, the Lord, the creator, the God of Abram, Isaac and Jacob. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed. So there's a time that will come to an end. This time of wrath, the great tribulation will come to an end. For what has been determined must take place. Now let's note this king who, who didn't come from a royal family or dynasty, as the scripture says, but he emerges from obscurity and takes upon himself the title of king and authority and leader. So he takes control and he does as he pleases. So in other words, he's a dictator, very much like Hitler. So that's an example for us to, to understand what is going to take place. Hitler came out of obscurity. In the first elections, he lost dismally. And then suddenly, at the next election, he won. And in a short period of time, he turned the democracy into a dictatorship. This is very much what this Antichrist is going to do. And he will exalt and magnify himself above every god. And he will say unheard of things against the god of gods. And he will be successful until this time of wrath or the time of the great tribulation ends. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the one desired by woman. Nor will he regard any God, but will exalt himself above them all. Just like Paul says, he'll sit in the temple, he'll present himself as if he is God or a representation of God. So he will not regard the gods of his fathers. Now remember if, as I'm suggesting, that out of the northern empire of the Muslims, this Antichrist will rise. So if, as the scripture is saying, he has no regard for the gods of his fathers. Now remember, at the time of this writing, at Daniel's time, Islam had not even been invented. It only came into being over 600 years after the New Testament. So he will disregard the gods of the Ishmaelites and take upon himself, as I'm suggesting, the new religion, the Islamic religion. 
But because, as Jesus said, this is an unprecedented time and the devil has been cast out of heaven and is now amongst us in absolute fury, who knows exactly what this man will do and what he will accomplish. He will also not have regard for the one that is desired by woman. Now, I believe that that's a reference to the Lord Jesus because there were many women that followed the Lord Jesus and um, like the woman at the well saying, that when Messiah comes, he will tell us all things. So there is a great expectation about the Messiah. So I believe it's a reference to the Messiah himself. So he will not regard any other God, but will exalt himself above them all. And that's exactly what the devil wants to do. As the book of Isaiah says, he will lift up his throne above the stars of heaven and he will make himself like God. So this is the ambition of Satan now expressed through the Antichrist. The angel continues, instead of them, instead of the gods of his fathers, he will honor a god of fortresses, a god unknown to his fathers. He will honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. Now, if I'm correct in suggesting that he is embracing this new religion of Islam, it is an anti-God the Father, anti the God of the Bible. It is also anti-Christ, but it is also anti the people of the book, as they call it. In other words, anti-Jews and anti-Christians. There couldn't be a more anti-Christ religion that he's embracing and it advocates jihad. So he honors the God of fortresses or the God of jihad and becomes militant and goes about destroying and building up his kingdom with with mayhem and destruction and bloodshed and he makes Antiochus Epiphanes look like a beginner. So he comes with the power of Satan, driving him forward to rise to prominence and to be the leader of the whole world, which is what his ambition is. He will attack the mightiest fortresses with the help of a foreign god. The devil is behind him, principalities and powers, and will greatly honor those who acknowledge him. So those who turn and join him, he will honor them. He will make them rulers over many people and will distribute the land at a price. Antiochus Epiphanes did a similar thing. At the time of the end, the king of the south will engage him in battle and the king of the north will storm out against him with chariots and, and cavalry and a great fleet of ships. He will invade many countries and sweep through them like a flood. He will also invade the beautiful land, Israel. Many countries will fall but Edom, Moab, and the leaders of Ammon will be delivered from his hand. That's interesting. So they will be spared, maybe because they're consenting to him and supporting him. But Edom, Moab, and the leaders of Ammon are modern-day Jordan and Saudi Arabia. So that area will be spared. He will not destroy them. Then it goes on. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall become ruler of the treasuries of gold and of silver and all the precious things of Egypt. So the king of the south will bear the brunt of his attack. And the Libyans and the Cushites shall follow in his train. Now, so North Africa, Egypt, as he's mentioned, and Sudan, all that area which is a Muslim area, will become part of his empire that he will raise up to use to dominate the world or try to dominate the world. So this man is not entirely invincible because reports from the east and the north will alarm him and he will set out in a great rage to destroy and annihilate many. Now this happened with Antiochus Epiphanes as well and he took out his fury on the nation of Israel. And that's exactly what this man is going to do because the Holy Covenant and Israel and Jerusalem in particular and the Temple Mount is really the focus. That's where he wants to establish himself, as Paul said, the abomination of desolation. Set himself up there and then from there endeavor to dominate the whole world. Now, this is what we read in the book of Revelation concerning the, the threat from the east. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. This seems to be China. He will pitch his royal tents between the seas at the beautiful holy mountains. 
So in other words, he will occupy the land and set up his headquarters between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. But thankfully, the scripture says, yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. Now here is something to consider. What is the most prominent thing that stands out in every picture that you see of Jerusalem? It is that golden dome on the Temple Mount. And that's very significant because that has been around right through our church history for 1,300 years. And I'd like us to consider this in the light of what Daniel is saying. Here is a map of the old Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem. And this area here is what is known as the Temple Mount. And that's where the dome of the rock is. That golden dome is right there in the center. So this is the most holy place on the face of the earth. And right in the center is this Muslim dome. It is not a Roman basilica. And it is not a Roman Catholic cathedral. But it is a Muslim shrine. Now the Wailing Wall, where all the Jews go and pray against that wall, is not a wall of the old temple. The temple was completely destroyed, as Jesus said. There was not one stone left upon another. But this wall, this wailing wall, is what Herod built as a retaining wall to extend the size of the Temple Mount because he wanted to extend the temple that had been built by Zerubbabel. He wanted to be like Solomon and build this great and glorious temple, which is what he did. But the Romans destroyed it in AD 70. So this wailing wall is really, as I said, a retaining wall for the Temple Mount. And this place, which God said he would put his name here, and this is where his temple was to be built. This is where David set up his tabernacle. This is the most holy place in all of the earth. And the Muslims now occupy it. They call it Al-Harim Al-Sharif, which means the Noble Sanctuary. Now let me draw your attention to the Arabic writing on this hexagonal shrine, this hexagonal building. So um, the arrows are pointing out the writing that goes right around this whole building. Here is a floor plan of the Dome of the Rock, that hexagonal building. And right around the outer wall and the inner wall, there are various quotes from the Quran that are written. So let's have a look at two of these that are translated into English to understand what is being said. So here it is in English. There is no God but God, meaning Allah. He is one. He has no associate. He begetteth not, nor was begotten contrary to the scriptures, and there is none comparable unto him. Muhammad is the messenger of God, or Allah. The blessing of God be upon him. Another inscription is this. God, meaning Allah, who hath not taken unto himself a son, so God has no son, and who hath no partner in the sovereignty, nor hath he any protecting friend through independence. So very clearly, they're making a statement about God, calling him Allah, so they're denying the God of Israel, and they're also denying that he has a son. So just to illustrate how important the Dome of the Rock is to Islam, here is a Palestinian pound with the Dome of the Rock on the currency. There is a Saudi Arabian note, likewise, the Dome of the Rock, also Jordan's um, currency, and the currency of Iran. I believe the Dome of the Rock is the second most holy place in the Islamic religion, they believe that Muhammad ascended to heaven from that spot, and that's why it is so important to them. Now let's see what John has to say about this. He says, But you, believers, have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth, because the, the anointing the Holy Spirit has shown you. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth about Antichrist and the Christ, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? So he's asking the question, who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Messiah. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. So very clearly, John is saying that that shrine and the declarations on that shrine, which come from the Quran, are Antichrist. So we have an Antichrist edifice on the holy place, which is clearly a blasphemy and therefore an abomination that brings desolation. 
Now, obviously, it is not the abomination that causes desolation, which both Daniel and Jesus and Paul spoke about, because that is still to come. But it is clearly a sign to all believers and has been for the last 1300 or more years. It has been there on the Temple Mount as a, as a very clear Antichrist sign. So no one who denies the Son has the Father, and whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So John is reassuring us that as we acknowledge the Lord Jesus as our Savior and Lord and as the Messiah, we also have the Father on our side. So let me conclude now with these very encouraging words from John. He says, See that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you, the gospel. If it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. So it's up to us to, by faith, hold fast, make sure our relationship is fresh and real. And we know, too, the scripture tells us that none shall pluck us from the Father's hand. He will hold on to us. He will remain faithful to us. We need to remain faithful to him. And this is what he promised us, even eternal life. Hold fast to that promise. I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray, that spirit of Antichrist that he was referring to. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. People have misinterpreted that, thinking that we don't need to be taught the scriptures and that we don't need uh, spiritual teachers to guide us and to teach us the word of God. That's, that is not what he's saying. He's saying this in the context of the Antichrist. So he's saying... We do have this anointing of the Holy Spirit within us. So even though there is great deception coming, and even though the Antichrist will come with the power of Satan to deceive and to corrupt and to break down and to destroy, nevertheless, the anointing that is within us is sufficient to hold us to the truth and help us to discern in those difficult days what is true and what is false. And that's really what he's saying to us. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. So he's saying this anointing is real, the revelation of Jesus Christ is real, and we need to hold fast to it because the devil is going to come with lying signs and wonders and deception. And if it were possible, Jesus said, even the very elect would be deceived. But John is reassuring us that the anointing, the Spirit of God within us, will keep us as we hold fast to the simplicity of Jesus Christ and to the glory and the wonder, and he will keep us. This is the opportunity for the testimony of Jesus to shine in the darkest hour in the history of the world. Amen. God bless you. Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha.